I'm up here more than I ever expected to be, but nice to see you all today. It's wonderful to be with you. Uh, we have a special guest uh, this morning, and I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy that this is happening because there have been a lot of steps that have led up to this day. Um, and so with us today is Pastor Roger Tanius. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Roger. Um, Roger has held a variety of roles in ministry over the course of his career. He's been a church planter. He planted a church in 2015 uh, called the Living Room Church, which was catered to young professionals in the Baltimore area. Uh, he served as a chaplain in a variety of organizations. He was with the, uh, the Maryland, excuse me, Maryland National Guard, where he was responsible for spiritual care for over 500 soldiers. Uh, he's been a chaplain in hospice and hospital and, and senior care settings um, and has worked with organizations like the VA Hospital of New York City. Um, most recently, uh, in 2021 and 2022, Roger uh, was pastoral intern for the Cherrydale Baptist Church in Arlington, Virginia. Roger is a 1997 graduate of the U.S. Mil Military Academy at West Point. Uh, and he holds a master's in divinity from uh, Regent School of Divinity. So we're thrilled to have Pastor Roger with us today. Um, and let's give him all a really warm welcome. Well, good morning, everyone. Man, um, thank you so much for the worship. Uh, James, thank you for the introduction. It's always awkward listening to someone talk about yourself. You're just kind of like, you know, it's kind of weird, right? Man, I'm excited to be here. Um, um, first of all, um, I just want to thank you guys um, for that amazing worship. Let's give it up for the worship team. Well, spring is here, guys. Spring is here. And uh, with spring being here, we have that uh, hope, right, that ray of hope that um, this might be the weekend, right? You're, you're thinking this might be the weekend. This might be the glorious weekend. This might be the stupendous weekend. This might be the amazing weekend when you can finally wear some shorts, y'all. This is a weekend where you can finally wear some shorts, and I, and I have this picture of this, um, this child in shorts just enjoying the summer, and that's how we feel with, with the dawn of summer. However, if you're like me, and you have Caribbean blood, all right, or if you have any type of warm weather blood, uh, you'll probably be wearing pants until it's in the mid-80s, right? Somebody know what I'm talking about. Or, truth be known, little confession, you probably might even sleep with a comforter in the summertime, okay? <laughs> Amen? Amen? Somebody picking up what I'm laying down. Uh, and uh, it's just incredible. So I thought something we could do, uh, since we're getting ready to hike, hiking season is coming, is, is play like a little game. Pretend this was family feud, right? Now with Steve Harvey with a little bit more hair, okay? Here we go. Here's what I'm going to ask you guys. According to Google... In your typical day hike, what are the essential things that you need for a day hike? What are the essential things that you need for a day hike? I'm going to put up the answers in a second, okay? But I want us to take a shot and guess. What are the essential things? What, is, what are they? What is it? Water. Awesome. Water. What else? Sneakers. Yes. You need something on your feet. Yes. Bug spray. Yes. First aid kit, good. What else? What is it? Snacks. That's a really good one. You don't want to be hangry on, <laughs> on a day trip, right? What else do you need? Sunblock. Yes, good. You guys are doing really good. I think you named all of them. What else? Rain jacket. You don't want to be wet on a day hike either. What else do you need? I think we should have a church hiking trip, right? Hats, good. What else? The word of God. This is the brother I want to hike with. All right, what else? A Glock? 
No? Okay. <laughs> Wrong crowd. Hairspray. Bear spray. I was like, hairspray. <laughs> yes, bear spray. That's really interesting. A watch. Yes, yes. Compass, a watch and a compass. All right, let's look at the answers, right, and we'll see how well we did. All right, there we go. Okay, a sun protection. Who said sun protection? Give it up. Well done. Well done. I don't have any prizes for you. I just have the word of God. Uh, headlamp. Did anyone say headlamp? I don't think you need a headlamp unless you're going in a cave, right? That would be weird. Um, navigation device. Who said navigation device? I think Priscilla. Give it up. Well done. All right. Uh, who said water? Right here. I think someone said water. Well done. Uh, snacks. Somebody said snacks. I know we got that. Well done. Well done. Uh, first aid kit. Yeah. Brother said first aid kit. Um, what else we got here? Water filter. Right? We didn't think about that. I think there's little things you can stick in the water, right, as a water filter. Um, extra layers. Yeah. All right. Not again. All right. Um, trekking poles. Who, who has trekking poles? Because I want to go hiking with you. We're going hiking. Awesome. Awesome. And then, can you believe this? Bear spray. <laughs> Give it up for Jay. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, listen. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness. Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness. And you can think of this as a much longer hike. And it's very interesting that in all three synoptic Gospels, when I say synoptic Gospels, I mean Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These are Gospels that give a synopsis of Jesus' life. In all three synoptic Gospels, uh, this wilderness narrative is in there. Uh, the Gospel of John, you're probably wondering, well, Pastor, didn't you mention John? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John is not a synoptic Gospel because John gives a heavenly look at the life of Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. But the other three give an earthly look at the life of Jesus. And all three, this wilderness narrative is there. What's even more astonishing is that in all three synoptic Gospels, the wilderness narrative is sandwiched in between Jesus' baptism and Jesus' public ministry. I mean, it's really quite incredible in all of them. Uh, look with me at Matthew uh, there on the slide there. You, you can see um, there, um, it starts with Jesus' baptism. Then there's Jesus' public ministry. And right there is the wilderness experience, sandwiched right in the middle. Look at Mark. Now, Mark is a much smaller, shorter gospel. Mark takes the other two and compresses it. So if you wanted a gospel that you could read quickly, it's the gospel of Mark. And in Mark, you see in that square area, if you could see it, right there what it says is Jesus' baptisms and then the testing of Jesus. And then right after, what does it say? Jesus announces the gospel. Right then again, it's sandwiched. And then when you go to Luke, in Luke, there again, Jesus' baptism, Jesus' public ministry, and there again, right in the middle, is the wilderness experience. It's almost as if this wilderness experience is a rite of passage. It's almost as if this wilderness experience is a time of Christian growth. Hmm. Mm. I already see someone looking at me. Hmm. It's almost like this wilderness experience, get this, is a time of purification. It's almost as if this wilderness experience is a time from beginner to maturity. It's a time we must all go through. We must all go through it. Now, in a culture where everyone wants to avoid suffering and pain, they don't want to hear this, but it's a time we must all go through. 
So the question is, will you be equipped to go through it? Will you be equipped to go through it? Will you be prepared to go through it? Will you have the right items in your backpack to go through it? Luckily, the Word of God tells us how to go through it biblically. The Word of God tells us how to go through it biblically. The title of my message this morning is Things You Need for the Journey. Things You Need for the Journey. Okay, let's read the scriptures. It's going to be exciting. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. Picture that. Jesus was just baptized, guys. The Son of God is just baptized. God incarnate was baptized. And he's led around in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. And he led him and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Picture this. Jesus, uh, the devil leads Jesus up to maybe that, that, that big barricade up there in the top, and he sees all the kingdoms of the earth at once. And the devil said to him, I will give you all of this domain and its glory for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> Therefore, that would be great to tell the devil that, by the way. Right? The next time the devil comes and bothers you, just say, liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Therefore, if you worship me, it shall all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. There are several spiritual nuggets of truth that come out of this passage. And, 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 we, and these, these truths we need to take and tuck away into our spiritual backpack. It would take an entire series for me to cover all of them. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to look at temptation number one. And I want to look at temptation number one, and I want to say, in that temptation, what are the spiritual truths that God leaves intentionally for us? We're going to look at them deeply. So let me read this passage again. I want to read it again from Luke chapter 4, 1 to 4, but I want to read it this time slowly and intentionally, and I would ask you to do something different. I would ask you to picture the scriptures as you hear it, like you're watching a movie. Picture the scriptures like you're watching a movie. It really does something to your soul. Picture it. Maybe as I read it, you don't see these words anymore. You actually see a movie. Picture it. As you hear it, faith comes by what? Hearing. Picture it. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, 
If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. Ah, oh, man, this is so good. This is so good. Notice with me in verse number one, Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's the word in Greek, pleras. Pleras. It's where we get the word plenty. You see, brothers and sisters, Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't going through a time of doubt. The, the wilderness was not a punishment because he was a bad Christian. He was full of the Holy Spirit. He was filled to the brim. He lacked nothing of the Holy Spirit. But yet he still had to go through the wilderness. Your wilderness experience is not a punishment. It's not a chastisement. Remember Job? You're in here because you did something wrong. No. Your wilderness experience is an intentional time that God has put you there so that you could grow closer to Him. You want some good news? Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit. The word led, it's the Greek word for um, ago. Ago. And ago means, this is so good, it means to, to lead someone while accompanying them. It means to lead someone while being attached to them. Jesus, between his baptism and his public ministry, was called by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, and the Holy Spirit was with him throughout it all. Throughout it all. You see, brothers and sisters, God's going to call you to some tough trials in your life. God's going to call you in this journey to some difficult things in your life. But the best part is he is with you throughout it all. I can't think of something better than that. I can't think of something better than that than to be brought to a moment to grow closer to God and He is with you, even attached to you throughout it all. I want you to notice the number 40 there. Jesus was led in the wilderness for 40 days. Does that sound like something else, Old Testament scholars? Yeah, brother. Uh, I knew I liked something about Dom. <laughs> he was led in the, the Israelites, the children of Israel, right? When they left slavery. Isn't this amazing, Dom? The children of Israel were called out of slavery to the promised land. But before they got to the promised land, they had to spend what? Forty years in the desert. Jesus is now baptized. And before he starts his public ministry, he spends 40 days in the wilderness. You, as children of God, now will be in a time of wilderness also. But God is ago with you. He is ago with you. I want to show you guys something really cool. Man, you guys want to see something really cool? This is really cool. And it's not just because I'm a Bible nerd. This is really cool. Well, I'm a Bible nerd. Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. Take a look at this. This is so cool. The context here is that God visits Moses, and he tells Moses, by the way, guys, here's what's really interesting. I don't know. Did you know that Moses killed somebody? Moses took a rock and crushed someone's skull yet God still uses him? That's another sermon. Moses was a murderer, yet God still uses him, yet God still calls him. How great is this God that we serve? 
I don't care what you did in your past. God can still use you. God will use you just to show off that he's God. So that's the context. This is the dude that took a rock and crushed someone's head. And he's out, you know, repenting and doing his thing. And then God comes to him. I got goosebumps and says, I want to use you. I got a big task for you. I want you to go back to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses says, I'm not qualified. How many of us would say that? Come on, honestly. I'm not qualified to let a million people out of slavery. Uh, Mo Moses says, you need, I, I, how will they listen to me? He goes, I'm going to give you special powers. And this was really cool in the scripture. He goes, take your hand and put your hand out here and then stick it back in, right? And then all of a sudden, they, he was like, grab, that, grab that, uh, that stick. Then the stick became a serpent. And then he said, throw it back on the ground. And then it became a stick. And he said, okay, take your hands and go like this. When he put his hand in here, it was leprosy. We stuck it back in, the hand was healed. He said, you got special powers. Then Moses comes back and says, well, I'm not good at speech. I'm not a good speaker. He says, well, I'm going to bring your brother Aaron with you, who's a good speaker. And then he tells Moses, this is what I want you to tell the Pharaoh. And these are the words. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. You guys see that? Why is that so cool? It's so cool because God calls Israel his son. From Egypt, slavery, to the promised land. Then in the New Testament, God calls Jesus his actual son. From baptism to public ministry. Guys, here's the thing. We get the inheritance of the Son. We are called sons, lowercase, of God. And so now God calls BCC congregation into an intentional time of suffering. Why? So that you could get closer to God and He is with you throughout it all. He's with you throughout it all. This is something the world cannot understand, that Christians can look at suffering and they could say, it's time to build an altar. This is what the world cannot understand. One day I'm going to teach about how all of Rome became Christians because when Christians were in the Colosseums, the Romans said, I need to have that type of faith. In the midst of of suffering in the midst of the lions they would praise the Lord that is the true demonstration of faith in the midst of your trials when you could know the triune God is with me rejoice in the Lord always I say again rejoice do you know where Paul was when he wrote that prison how can a man in prison say rejoice in the Lord always the Lord is near. The Lord is near. Brothers and sisters, this is it. In the midst of your trials, in the midst of your sufferings, in the midst of your financial pain, in the midst of your chronic pain, in the midst of your relationship situation, in the midst of your marriage situation, the Lord is near. The Lord is near. It is a power that no one can understand. The Lord is near. He is near. He is near. I can't think of something better than that. I can't think of something better than that. I want you to look at the schemes of the devil. So when you see it in your own life, not if, when, you know how to handle it. In Luke chapter 4, Verse 3, listen to what the devil tells Jesus. He says, and the, devil to, and the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. 
And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. I want you to notice that there are two specific temptations here. There's the temptation against identity and the temptation against faith. The temptation against identity and the temptation against faith. If you are, let's look at identity first. If you are the son of God, hey, does this ever sound familiar when you're in your wilderness? If you're really a Christian, why are you suffering? If you're really a Christian, why didn't you get that promotion? If you're really a Christian, why are you having marital problems? If you're really a Christian, why are you having financial problems? If you're really a Christian, why do you have chronic pain? The temptation against identity. How about the temptation against faith? This is a good one, too. In your wilderness experience, here's the faith one. Why are you here? Did God abandon you? Did he forget about you? Here's another one. Find the quickest way to get out of this. Find a way to circumvent the process and get out. What is the quickest way to get out of the wilderness? Brothers and sisters, family, either one of those responses is forgetting the spiritual principle of ago. That God is with you in the wilderness. That God is the one who leads you there. And not only does he lead you, he accompanies you. And not only does he accompany you, Father, Son, and Spirit is attached to you in the wilderness. Find a way to build an altar in your wilderness. Find a way to worship God in your wilderness. Find a way to remember that the triune God is with you in your wilderness. I love how Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8.3. He responds to the devil with scripture. He quotes Deuteronomy 8.3 and he says, man shall not live on bread alone. Do you guys remember how the rest of that goes? Thank you, brother. Only on the word of God. That's Deuteronomy. And isn't it particularly interesting that this is way in the New Testament? But here Jesus is quoting the Old Testament. Jesus, as a good Jew, knows his scripture. He quotes the Old Testament. Guys, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament what? Revealed. But by, by Jesus quoting the Old Testament, he affirms the Old Testament. We love the Old Testament, right? We love it, but we also know that the New Testament is the Old Testament is the Old Testament revealed. I want to look at Deuteronomy chapter eight because Jesus quotes it, so it's got to be important. Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse three. Look with me in that slide there. Look what look what look what God says here. It says, He humbled you and let you be ang hungry. Guys. God will let you be hungry. Hungry is symbolic for whatever you're going through. He'll let you. But it gets better. And in that situation, he fed you with manna. Do you remember what manna was? Manna was the flaky bread that the Israelites received. But it only had a shelf life of one day. You couldn't, you couldn't, like I would try, right? You couldn't take a bunch of manna and store it up and say, I got some for tomorrow because it spoils. It's only good for one day. What is God teaching us? Give us this day our daily bread. In your wilderness, God is trying to teach you to trust him day by day. 
In your wilderness, God is trying to tell you, slow it down and learn to trust me day by day. He's wanting to teach you that in your wilderness. That he might make you, what's that word? Understand. In your wilderness, God has something for you to understand. Don't miss it. He's got something he wants you to understand. And here's what he wants you to understand. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that what? Proceeds out of the mouth of God. In your wilderness, God is trying to teach you to press in on the word of God. More than ever. What if you, brothers and sisters, looked at your wilderness experience as a spiritual boot camp that you would learn to press in on the Word of God? Here's how I want to land the plane. Are you going through a difficult time? Are you going through an uncertain time? Are you going through a stressful time? Are you going through an anxious time? Are you going through a painful time? More than ever, now is the time to press in on the Word of God. More than ever, now is the time to make the Word of God your lifeline. More than ever, Now is the time to build an altar of praise in your wilderness. More than ever, now is the time to hold on to the Word of God. More than ever. I want to to invite the worship team to come up. I want to leave you guys with three specific things that you can write down. These are three things that you can put in your backpack. These are three things that you can put in your spiritual backpack. I'm going to um, ask the worship team to just play some soft um, music while we talk about these three things. Three things to put in your spiritual backpack when the wilderness comes. Not if, but when the wilderness comes. Number one, faith. Faith. And I've intentionally left the word faith a little bit ominous here because each of us needs something different in terms of faith. So let me ask you a question. What type of faith do you need in your wilderness experience right now? What type of faith do you need? Maybe if you're a thinker like me, you need childlike faith. That's what the Lord told me. Roger, you need some more childlike faith. You need to remember that time you first got saved, how you ran through the leaves saying, Jesus is real. You need that type of faith once again. Maybe you need faith to wait. You know, there's a difference between chronos time, human time, and rhema time. Maybe you've been waiting so long to get that news about pregnancy. Maybe you've been waiting so long for that promotion. Maybe you've been waiting so long for that healing. Or maybe you need the faith to distinguish between chronos time and rhema time. What, what kind of faith is God asking you to press into in this wilderness time? Second thing to put in your backpack is the Word of God, y'all. Like my brother said, it's the Word of God. And I'm going to ask you to not just put this beautiful book I'm going to ask you to pick one or two scriptures that really give you energy and put that in there. 
What is the one or two scriptures that you can grab onto that when you're in the wilderness, you feel like the kid in a candy store? You know, what? I have an image of a kid running out on a playground. What are the one or two scriptures that do that for you? How about this? What's the biblical principle that does that for you? You know what it is for me, guys? It's the triune God. It's me picturing myself in the wilderness, but knowing the Father, Son, and Spirit is with me. Every other religion has just a unipersonal God. We got one God that is Father, Son, and Spirit. He's with me in the wilderness. You can't stop me, devil, because the Father, Son, and Spirit is with me in the wilderness. Number three, I want you to put the spiritual principle of ago in your backpack. The spiritual principle that God is the one himself that puts you in the wilderness and he's also the one who accompanies you and is attached to you throughout the entire wilderness. The wilderness is a time to intentionally grow closer to God and God does not abandon you. He is with you inside that time the whole time so that you can grow into a strong man of God, a strong woman of God. He gives you the opportunity to grow. And sometimes growing takes a little pain. We do it in the gym all the time. Why don't we do it spiritually? Can you, can you now say thank you for the wilderness? Because my Jesus is with me in the wilderness. The Holy Spirit is with me in the wilderness. Thank you, God. You want to crush the devil's head? In the middle of your wilderness, you say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that I'm in this wilderness. I don't understand it. It looks dark here. It looks grim here. But you're walking with me in this wilderness, God. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. And all your friends will say, are you crazy? And then you say, I'm not crazy. I just have a relationship with the triune God. I have a relationship with him. I'm not crazy. You're crazy. <laughs> you're crazy. To live this life without the triune God, you're crazy. You are so blessed. You are so loved. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to hand this over to the worship team. I want you to picture whatever wilderness you're in. I'm, I know what mine is. I want you to picture it. Ooh, there's some healing here. I want you to picture it, and this is what I want you to say. No doctor would ever want you to say this. If you want to kneel on the ground, if you want to come up to the altar, I want you to picture it and I want you to say, thank you that I'm here. Because you're here with me. And let the healing come.